We want to get people as early as possible. The earlier you come in, the earlier you start on the treatment, the better the outcome typically. We spent 30 years in the laboratory looking at what are the molecular mechanisms of neurodegeneration. Why do you get Alzheimer's so frequently? And how does this actually work? What are the things that are driving this process? And what we found is that the, what we call Alzheimer's disease is actually a protective response. It's really a protective downsizing response to multiple different insults. And so the whole point of the protocol is that in previous studies of Alzheimer's and treatments, people would always try to treat without understanding what's actually causing it. So they would give you a drug that doesn't have anything to do with why you have Alzheimer's disease. So after the research, for the first time, we were able to say, here are the things that actually drive this process. And you can see that what's at the heart of Alzheimer's disease is is actually a molecular switch that is integrating and looking at all sorts of potential insults and on the other hand all sorts of potential positives. So we call this synaptoblastic, which are the things that are making synapses, and synaptoclastic, the things that are pulling them apart. And there's a beautiful balance that you have during your lifetime. As you begin to get older, you can have an imbalance just as you would with osteoporosis. Alzheimer's disease is very much of a synaptoporosis. You don't have the things. So if it's infl uh, inflammation that can be from Borrelia, that can be from various organisms, that can be from leaky gut, if it is trophic loss, loss of nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, hormones, nutrients, if it's glycotoxicity, so you have insulin resistance, or if it's toxicity from metallotoxins, organic toxins, or biotoxins, such as mycotoxins, these things are all contributors. So the whole purpose of the protocol is to identify all of the contributors, and we typically find that people have between 10 and 25. It's usually not one. One. And then we want to trigger and want to look at each of those and target each of those contributors. So if you have a high homocysteine, we want to bring it down. If you have a leaky gut, we want to heal that and we want to bring down your HSCRP so that your inflammation declines. If you have ongoing exposure to mycotoxins, we need to flush those out and we need to remove the exposure to the molds and on and on and on. So there are dozens of things that we look at to determine what's actually causing this. And as you can imagine, it's personalized. So it's different for each person what is causing their decline. The other thing I should add is we want to get people as early as possible. The earlier you come in, the earlier you start on the treatment, the better the outcome typically. So oral health is absolutely critical for cognitive function. And here's the thing. When you actually look in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's, you find multiple different types of organisms from different people. For some people, it is P. gingivalis, or F. nucleatum, from the oral cavity. For some, it's herpes simplex from the lip. For some, it's fungi from the sinuses. For some, it's actually the Borrelia, the the organism from Lyme. So on and on, there are different organisms that gain access to your brain. Recently, an interesting report of what happens when you get exposed to candida and that that can actually enter your brain. So what we call Alzheimer's disease is actually a protective response. And uh, professors Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi at Harvard University showed a number of years ago that in fact, the amyloid beta peptide has an antimicrobial effect. So it is part of this downsizing response. A little bit like if people come across your borders and they're trying to attack you, you may put down napalm, which unfortunately now makes you have less arable soil. You are trying to kill the invaders, but in so doing, you are downsizing. So absolutely, oral hygiene is an important one, as are any of the other things, whether it's leaky gut, whether it's exposure, whether it's skin lesions, anything that creates systemic inflammation chronically can be a contributor to, to cognitive decline.
The Copa Monieri uh, is an herb that's actually been used for thousands of years by the Ayurvedic physicians, and it supports cognition. And it turns out to have a number of things called bacopicides, and these things have multiple mechanisms of action. So one thing, for example, they inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is critical for making and storing memory. So you have a cholinesterase inhibitor that allows you to have more acetylcholine. Interestingly, they also increase the synthesis of the acetylcholine. So you've got a better cholinergic tone. They also have an antioxidant effect, and they also actually have an effect on some other what are called monoamine transmitters. So multiple actions of these bacopicides to support cognition. Bacopa is available generally. Um, it's a good idea if you have cognitive decline for any reason. It's a good idea to have a practitioner and health coach to work with, but anybody can ob obtain uh, Bacopa monieri. Melatonin, again, has a number of, of positive effects. Uh, a lot of people like to take it because it has an anti-cancer effect, uh, but of course it enhances sleep and it actually reduces the net production of the amyloid beta, which collects in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. And so we tend to use it at least in part because we want people to get the best uh, regenerative sleep. Sleep is such a critical time where you have autophagy going on, where you actually have cleansing of the brain going on, where you have a reduction in the production of amyloid. Uh, so you also have a uh, synthesis of, of human growth hormone, which occurs during sleep. So for many reasons, sleep is critical and most people who have cognitive decline are actually getting too little sleep and low quality sleep. It's also important to know from oximetry, you can literally stick an oximeter on the finger, you can have your doctor loan, loan one to you, it's very easy to do. You want to know if you're having desaturation events at night. Many people have cognitive decline effects and also effects on blood pressure and heart disease and things from having sleep apnea. So you want to know if you have that. That's a, a, a commonly undiagnosed, about 70% of people with sleep apnea go undiagnosed. So another thing that's helpful. So melatonin is one of the ways to enhance sleep and reduce the chances of cognitive decline. It's something that your body makes naturally. It starts to make less as you get older. Now, you don't necessarily want to take large amounts. So people typically find anything between a half of a milligram and three milligrams to be about right. If you take too much, you'll know it typically because you'll sleep hard for a few hours and then you'll wake up um, and have trouble getting to sleep again. So people, but people have gone up to 20, 50, and even 100 milligrams. But the, the physiological range, you typically want to be in that 0 0.5 to 3 milligram range. PQQ is quinoline quinone, and the reason people take that is because it actually increases your mitochondrial number. So that's been the, the, the outcome of PQQ and the goal. So as we age, again, we often have fairly poor a function of our mitochondria. And in fact, it's helpful actually to have turnover of the mitochondria, so-called mitophagy. It's a little bit like throwing out the worn out batteries. If you continue to try to work with the, with the poor batteries without replacing them, um, in fact, you're at risk for Parkinson's disease. So it's good to have new, fresh, and active mitochondria, and just as you support your gut microbiome, to support your mitochondria, which of course come from ancient bacteria that are now inside your cells. So uh, that's the idea of using PQQ and other mitochondrial supports. So here's the interesting thing about hormesis. We have a range where we were meant to work, designed, our bodies were designed to work. If you exceed that dramatically, you actually damage the system. And so in fact, chronic mismatch between the way the system was meant to work, brain, bones, etc., is what leads to degenerative disease. You literally are downsizing what's there because you cannot handle the mismatch. However, right at the edge, before you get to this dramatic in, uh, mismatch between what your body was made to handle and what it is handling, what it can handle, you're pushing the system. And that's what you do every day with exercise. So exercise pushes your system a little bit, and that's what hormesis is all about. You are literally producing a modest insult that allows your body to respond in a supportive, regenerative, and improving way. 
Uh, so that's the idea of hormesis. And again, so you want to be very careful. You don't want to go off scale so that you actually damage the components. So it was noted years ago that the copper zinc ratio tends to be too high in people who have cognitive decline, often typically over 1.3 in looking at serum copper and serum zinc. Uh, and those aren't actually the best ways to measure uh, copper and zinc, but it's a common way to measure it. And if the ratio gets too high, that is associated with cognitive decline. Now, Professor George Brewer at University of Michigan spent his whole career looking at copper and zinc and cognitive decline. And his argument and his takeaway from his years of research was that most of us, in part because of copper piping, part because of exposure to various things that have copper in them, like vitamins uh, that, are, that contain copper, tend to be too high on the copper side and too low on the zinc side. Now, there are other reasons. Zinc is also absorbed poorly, for example, if you are on proton pump inhibitors. So we see this very frequently for people who've been on PPIs for years. They have very low zinc. There are about one billion people on Earth who are zinc deficient. And zinc deficiency actually causes a number of the things that are associated with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. So it changes your immune status. It changes your insulin sensitivity and your ability to produce and utilize insulin. So you actually want to bring your copper zinc ratio closer to one to one, which for many people means bringing the copper down a little bit and bringing the zinc up a little bit. You may have, for example, a poor immune response. You may begin to get uh, pre-diabetes um, you may have some cognitive decline. And often the type of cognitive decline that we see with high copper zinc ratios is what we call type 3 Alzheimer's, which is a toxic associated Alzheimer's. That tends to occur more with the toxic form of Alzheimer's and may contribute to it. <clears throat> so that what the type 3 often presents with a non-amnestic Alzheimer's. So people, instead of the first thing going is learning new things and new memory, the first thing that goes tends to be things like like organization. They just can't do their jobs anymore. They're the ones that actually get fired from their positions the first. Because if you've got a bad memory, but you can still do everything else, you can get along really well for years with what you've already learned. On the other hand, if you can't organize things, you can't calculate, you just can't set things up, then you tend to do very poorly at your job very early on. So lion's mane is a mushroom. It's Hericium arenaceus, uh, and it's been shown to increase the production of nerve growth factor, which again supports the very synaptoblastic to synaptoclastic ratio uh, that is critical for Alzheimer's disease. And so there are actually ongoing trials of Hericium uh, in Alzheimer's disease. But again, we prefer it as part of an overall program so that you're addressing the various things and you're gonna be increasing the trophic support of the synapse synapses, and so we include lion's mane with that. So we do encourage people, especially if, they've, if they're at high risk for Alzheimer's or if they, are, if they already have some cognitive decline, then as part of an overall program that may include many pieces, yes, lion's mane is one of the ones that we would suggest because of its effect to increase nerve growth factor. We also suggest whole coffee fruit extract, which increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We also suggest to get your hormones optimized because again, that provides support for synaptic maintenance. Looking at what actually increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a number of things that have come up from research, and one of them is this whole coffee fruit extract, which increases the production. Now, you can exercise and also increase your production. Also, whole coffee fruit extract, both good ways to increase production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And then there's another thing that's actually been, uh, it was discovered by Dr. Yi at Emory University, um, which is called 7 8 dihydroxyflavone and that actually binds to the to the BDNF receptor. So it's essentially one step downstream from producing the BDNF. So these are all ways to enhance your trophic support of your synapses. So you can literally trace the molecular pathways that, that goes to APP, which is the amyloid precursor protein, which is the critical switch when times are good, when you have appropriate support, you cleave this at a single site, you produce two peptides, SAPP-alpha and alpha-CTF, that actually signal 
growth and maintenance in your synapses. So that's when things are good. When things are bad, in fact, you've got inflammation, you've got insulin resistance, you've got nutrient and trophic loss, you've got toxicity. This thing now senses literally and gets cleaved at three sites, which are the beta, gamma, and caspase sites, to produce four peptides that literally signal your nervous system things are bad, we need to pull back, we need to downsize. So literally trying to live within, within the means of what is available at the time. Now, you can trace direct paths from specific hormones, such as estradiol, and you can trace beautifully the path from inflammation. So whether it's related to gut leak, whether it's related to specific microorganisms, poor diet, what have you, you activate a mediator called NF-kappa B, which literally enters, which enters your nucleus and turns on hundreds of different genes. And two of the genes that it affects are the ones that make the cleavage of the APP to produce the four pulling back peptides. So you can trace directly from inflammation to change in gene expression to cleavage and now signaling downsizing. And so the inflammation from whatever cause is critical. Now, I should add, people always say, well, you don't want inflammation, so just take an anti-inflammatory. Well, remember, the inflammation is there for a reason. So before you take the anti-inflammatory, you want to remove the causes of the inflammation. That For all these things, you want to go to the root cause. That's critical. Once you've removed that, you want to resolve the inflammation, and there are things called resolvents that do that, and then you want to prevent the inflammation in the future. But the most important is to determine what's causing it and remove that. The cytokines are simply signaling molecules. They're, they're messengers that come typically with, they can be pro-inflammatory or they can be anti-inflammatory. So these are modifiable, they're modulating molecules that are sent from cell to cell with respect to inflammation, inducing spreading the word essentially, uh, and, uh, and then spreading the word that, hey, now we're gonna, we're gonna decrease the inflammation when it is appropriate. So for example, people with Alzheimer's typically have an increase in their pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 and things like that. So in the past, it was always said that people should not find out if they have APOE4. Uh, this is the most common genetic risk factor. Now about 75 million Americans have a single copy. If you have zero copies, and that's about 240 million Americans, that's the common one, your chance through your lifetime of getting Alzheimer's is right around 9%. It's not zero, but it's not too high. If you have a single copy, it's about 30%. If you have two copies, it's over 50%, so most likely you will get it. One of the things that we recommend is to, first of all, to check it out, find out what you have, because in the past it was said you don't wanna know because there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's now a tremendous amount you can do about it. What it really says is that you're, you have a mismatch in that having APOE4 makes it so that you have a quick trigger for inflammation. Great if you are walking on the savanna five million years ago and you're stepping on dung and puncturing your feet and you're eating uh, microbe laden uh, raw meat, all these things, it's great to have APOE4. And that was the dominant one for 96% of hominid evolution. But in the last 220,000 years, uh, APOE3 appeared, and then the last 80,000 years, APOE2 appeared. So most of us now are APO, about three quarters of us are APOE4 negative. So first of all, there's a wonderful website, APOE4.info, started by a woman, Julie G, uh, and very helpful, and people share information and share their sorts of protocols and the sorts of things they're doing. Second thing is to recognize that you are at risk for inflammation. So if you are more sensitive to things like poor dentition, leaky gut, and things like that. Third thing is to recognize you also are better at absorbing fat. And so you have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But the good news is you can adopt an appropriate lifestyle and take appropriate supplements uh, where, where they, they are necessary. And you can change your risk 
with this approach. So in fact, you have no more risk than if you were ApoE4 negative. And in this one simple example, the magnitude of the effect of one copy of ApoE4 is approximately equal to the magnitude of effect of routine exercise. So that alone, very helpful. But there's a series of things you can do to make it so that your risk is minimal. So we coined this term cognoscopy simply because it's easy to remember, it's a silly term, but it's easy to remember that when you turn 50, we, you know, you, everyone should have a colonoscopy. Good to know because it can reduce your risk of a future of getting a, a colorectal cancer. And you can catch them early and make it so that you don't die from colorectal cancer. Great thing to do. So whether you're 45 or older, you want to get a cognoscopy. Now, if you're younger than that, probably just wait, uh, but if there's a strong family history, you may ch want to check as well. It's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Uh, and so you, with a cognoscopy, you want to know what are all of my risk factors? Do I have ongoing inflammation? Because most people aren't aware of it until it gives them problems down the road, like cognitive decline. Do I have insulin resistance? Again, you're headed for a problem, potentially cognitive decline or type 2 diabetes, vascular disease, things like that. Do I have reduction in critical nutrients or critical hormones? Do I have exposure to toxins that I'm unaware of? Do I have a poor vasculature? All of these things are good to know about, and you can do it with a simple set of blood tests. Then to add to that, you want to have a simple online cognitive assessment. Now, if you're completely asymptomatic, that's all you need. Blood testing and a cognitive screen. If you already have symptoms, you want to add a volumetric MRI. So you want to have an MRI and you know you want to know where, what is the status of my hippocampi, what's the volume. And so though that's a st fairly straightforward way to determine where you stand. And the hope is going forward, we want to reduce the global burden of dementia by having people look at these things before they actually have Alzheimer's disease. So you can go on The End of Alzheimer's, the book, and look at all the different tests and get all the specific ranges for those. In general, we recommend that people go by the target. In other words, we personalize this based on what you need. However, yes, there are some supplements um, that for many people, it's partly because so many of us are deficient in some of these things. So um, one thing uh, to think about, we talked about Bacopa earlier, um, Bacopa monieri um, is benign and actually can support cognition. Uh, ashwagandha is another one that is benign and that supports cognition. And then uh, omega-3s and citicoline. So omega-3s support synapse formation. As you know, they're anti-inflammatory. Um, Citicoline, work done from, uh, from Professor Wortman at MIT for years, also supports, uh, supports uh, synapse formation and maintenance. Uh, magnesium 3 and 8, um, this came from Dr. Gosong Liu uh, in his work also at MIT, uh, and that also uh, supports, and in fact, they've published trials showing improved cognition with that. So in, in as a general rule, um, we say look at your look at your status to see what is going to be best for you. But there are definitely some basics for everyone. You want to support gut health, you want to support your microbiome, and therefore you want to know if you have leaky gut and you want to have probiotics and prebiotics. And if you can get those in your food, that's even better with your fermented foods and of course your prebiotics, things like jicama. So these are all helpful optimizing gut function, optimizing synaptic function, and optimizing your nutrients. For most people, taking some vitamin D is helpful. You, want to, you don't want to have a low vitamin D because that's also important for cognitive function. So the diet that we recommend is called KetoFlex 12-3. And the idea is we're trying to drive a specific biochemistry that supports synapse formation and maintenance. So the first part, keto, it's, it induces mild ketosis. And we'd like to see people, and you can get a simple ketone meter, we'd like to see people between 1.5 and 4 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate. So it's helpful, and in fact, your brain tends to function better when you're running on ketones than when you're running on glucose. 
we'd like to get rid of insulin resistance. And so that's part of this. So the second part is flex, so keto flex. That means it's flexitarian. You, if you want to have, be a vegetarian, no problem. If you want to have some meat and fish, that's fine as well. Uh, but you want to have the right kinds. You want to have wild-caught fish, of course. You want to have grass-fed beef, if you're going to have that. And you want to have pastured chicken, if you're going to have that. You don't want this stuff filled with toxins and hormones and things like that. And so, you, and in general, as a general rule, we'd like to, to recommend that people use meat as a condiment. So you don't want to use massive amounts. The main thing you should be eating is vegetables and typically non-starchy vegetables. You want to have a plant-rich, high-fat, medium-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. That seems to work best. And then the 12-3, 12, 12 is the minimum in terms of hours between finishing dinner and starting your breakfast, brunch, or lunch. If you're APOE4 positive, you actually need to go a little longer, 14 to 16 hours. If you're APOE4 negative, 12 to 14 hours is enough. That will help you to get into ketosis, help you to induce autophagy and improve brain support. And then the three means three hours minimum between finishing dinner and going to bed. So KetoFlex 12-3 is the overall approach. It's a plant-rich, ketogenic diet. Autophagy is what happens inside the cell where what, when you have not enough support, so you're giving a rest literally to the system, you literally undergo a cleaning effect inside the cell. And this is trigger, and there are three different types, macroautophagy, microautophagy, and chaperone-mediated autophagy. And these function a little bit like vacuuming and cleaning your house. If you had people coming into your house 24-7, you never had time to clean it, it would be a disaster, right? So this way, People go home, you have a few minutes alone here, and now you can actually do the vacuuming, you can actually put back things where they're supposed to be. That's what happens. By the way, one of the things you do is recycle proteins, lipids, and you break down mitochondria. These things all enter an endosome and ultimately interact with a lysosome so that you break them down inside the lysosome and recycle the components. Chronic inflammatory response syndrome is a name coined by Dr. Shoemaker that is, uh, that is for people who have a response which can be from several different causes. It can be from mycotoxins from molds. It can be from various building materials, inflammagens. Uh, volatile organic compounds. It can be from Lyme disease. Anything that is triggering your innate immune system, that's the evolutionarily older part of the immune system, to be active chronically. And what he found is that this induces a number of different responses that affect your health. For example, you can develop asthma, you can develop rashes, you can develop nosebleeds, you can develop changes with your visual contrast sensitivity, you can develop changes in your cognition, you can develop uh, arthritis, you can develop Parkinson's. And cognitive decline is one of the things that we found occurs with this. Now, what was surprising is that when we started to see people who have what we call type 3 Alzheimer's. These, the, these are the people who have toxic Alzheimer's. They have the sort of lab tests that Dr. Shoemaker described. However, they typically don't have the peripheral components. They typically don't have the asthma. They typically don't have the, the rashes. So these are closely related phenomena, the SIRS, and this type 3 Alzheimer's. So we had to come up with some term for something that is like SIRS but doesn't seem to have the peripheral markers. So we call this ISIS, which is innate system immune stimulation. The bottom line is the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease that collects in the brain is actually part of the innate immune system's response. So as long as you are responding to something with an inflammatory response, you are producing this and putting yourself at increased risk for cognitive decline. So the things that affect immunity, and there's a two part here. One part is what actually induces the inflammation and then the response to it. But the other is the ability of your immune system to have an appropriate response. 
too brisk of a response, you get an autoimmune condition like multiple sclerosis. Too weak of a response, you don't respond and you now have more spread of the inflammatory process itself. So you have, if you've got, a, for example, if you've got Lyme disease, or if you've got mold exposure, these things now can go farther. So in fact, there is this cold war that is ongoing. So we want to do both. We want to support the immune system and there are a number of ways to do that. And certainly the, the Ayurvedic physicians like to do it with a triad of tinospora, amalaki, uh, and ashwagandha, which some people like to use. Others want to find what the specific uh, microbes they're dealing with, target those directly with specific antifungals or antimicrobials. Then, what are the things that are actually causing this? For most people, it are, there are several things. So if you have a leaky gut, um, and this comes up again and again and again, it's a common problem. You are spilling things like lipopolysaccharide from the cell walls of the bacteria. You are spilling bacteria, foods that you're interacting with, as opposed to well-digested food. So now you are in, incre at increased risk for things like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that, and so you've got ongoing inflammation. The other thing, of course, poor dentition, another way. Air pollution has turned out to be a relatively common way to have an inflammatory response. And so organisms, poor diet, leaky gut, sinusitis. Many of us have a chronic mild sinusitis that we kind of ignore for years. And this again, this has access, and so you have to be concerned about the exposure to your brain. So all these different things can give you neuroinflammation. Not only can alcohol cross the blood-brain barrier, but all alcohol actually affects vitamin B1, thiamine, which has a dramatic role in memory. So we recommend if you've got cognitive decline, if you're gonna have a, you know, a glass of wine a few times a week, that's probably fine, but you don't ever wanna take enough alcohol that you're actually damaging your cognition because you are having a direct effect. It is a neurotoxin, and it is a neurotoxin that also has this effect on thiamine, which is critical for memory formation, and so people get ultimately what's called Wernicke syndrome, uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, and, the, and can lose their ability to form new memories. Now, most people don't go that far, but we'd like to have people keep their thiamine appropriate, and in fact, it only takes a few weeks to get low on your thiamine. Uh, it's not one of these vitamins that's stored for years. So alcohol has multiple mechanisms by which it can create problems with cognition. So Marcon's is, again, something that was uh, pointed out by, by Dr. Richie Shoemaker, and this stands for Multiply Antibiotic Resistance Coag Negative Staph. So these are organisms that tend to form biofilms. And when you have bacteria that are together, it's a little bit like having a community of bacteria that's all embedded uh, in a fort. It, it's much harder to get rid of them. Interestingly, if you look at what amyloid beta does, it looks like not only an endogenous antimicrobial, but an endogenous antibiofilm because one of the things that you need to do when you want to get rid of biofilms is to chelate the metals that are in the biofilm. That helps the biofilm to dissolve, and now you can get at the bacteria with the antimicrobial. Well, that's what amyloid beta does. It has both a metal chelating and an antimicrobial effect. So it literally looks like an endogenous antibiofilm. Now, Marcon's can contribute to SIRS and can contribute to cognitive decline. The, you're basically giving a protective region for microbes to live. They can produce, for example, proteases and peptidases that decrease your, for example, MSH, that affect your cognitive function and that lower your trophic support as a whole. And of course, in keep, keep the ongoing inflammation going. So you can literally do swabs that test for Marcon's. And it's been pointed out by Dr. Shoemaker that what you're really testing for, it's, it's a surrogate marker for biofilm. So you wanna know, are, is there Marcon's and is it part of biofilm? So there are multiple ways to go after Marcon's. Um, some people use biocidin, some people use a colloidal silver, um, some people use uh, a, uh, a 
combination uh, antibiotic regimen called Beg Spray. So we just recently published a paper with 100 patients with documented improvement. And the idea is that it has been claimed in the past that you couldn't see improvement for people who have Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's. And these people, we had some with Alzheimer's, even some with advanced and some with pre-Alzheimer's. And this came from 15 different sites. So this isn't just one group claiming that they're seeing it. These are 15 different sites that showed demonstrated and documented improvement in cognition in a hundred different patients. In, in addition, some people showed also improvements in quantitative EEG. Some people showed improvements in evoked responses, so-called P300. Some people showed improvement in hippocampal volume. So all these objective measures showed improvement in these particular patients. Now, this doesn't mean that every single patient improves, but this is a collection of a hundred that showed documented improvement. Movement. In the past, we've dealt with scourges. We had the scourge of black plague, the scourge of leprosy, the scourge of polio. We don't worry about these scourges today. We should not have to worry about the scourge of Alzheimer's. So our goal is that within a few decades, the scourge of Alzheimer's would be seen just as the scourge of the black plague or the scourge of polio. And taking an approach with prevention and early reversal and targeting the things that actually can do this, we can reduce the global burden of dementia. And in fact, we can view Alzheimer's as a very rare disease and as a past scourge. So that's the goal. What our work shows is that when you individualize care and you give people a plan, and I, and I know you've asked me at least three times now, well, what should people do? What I'm trying, <laughs> why I'm, why I'm, why I'm uh, delaying things is because it really truly needs to be individualized. And what we, what we use is a term called the ABCs of Alzheimer's prevention management. Mm. Based on the data, we get data on A's, the B's, and the C's. A stands for anthropometrics. Anthropometrics is basically a, a fancy A word for body composition. What is your body fat? What is your waist circumference? What is your muscle mass? Depending on these factors, we're going to change the recommendations we give. The B stands for blood-based biomarkers. We're going to look at markers of uh, lipids, cholesterol markers, also advanced markers that preventative cardiologists use, for example, that you know most neurologists honestly don't don't really pay attention to. We look at uh, metabolic markers, insulin resistance. We look at inflammatory markers. We look at nutrition markers. You know, instead of you know saying, okay, well, go eat fish; it's good for you. We're going to look at the markers in the blood. We're then going to tell you based on your blood and based on your genetics how much fish you should be eating, what types of fish. So, so the the take home point is we're going to get granular with every patient. The other thing we do is in the blood based biomarkers, we look at genetics. We look at the ApoE four variant; it's the most common um, risk gene. Doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's if you have the variant, but it increases your risk. Well. If I know that you have the ApoE4 variant, they check for this in, in 23andMe and millions of people have, have gotten this checked, I'm going to personalize your care differently. If you have the variant, I'm going to give you plan A, B, and C. If you don't have the variant, I'm going to give you a little bit modified plan X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. If you have two copies of the variant, you have a different plan altogether. That's only 1% yes. of the population. So you know, the, the, the take home is we, we take all these markers and then the C is cognitive function. And we understand a person's cognitive baseline. We look at memory function, language abilities, learning abilities, uh, speed of processing, attention, and executive function, which is higher order processing. We take all of this and the patient's medical history. We, we, we learn about the patient. We learn everything we can about them, about their family, and then we personalize a plan. So those 21 different things are based on that person individually. And, you know, there's a lot of overlap. If you, if you want me to say, okay, well, what are the core things? Well, exercise on a regular basis. Okay, well, exercise on a regular basis is good, but every person gets a different plan. If we're putting someone on a plan for body fat loss, we're going to give them a different plan. Steady state mm -hmm. cardio, for example, some people would call that zone two training. Um, steady state cardio at 60 to 65% of your heart rate. There's different ways to do this through lactate testing, through a variety of things that we do you know, more precisely in our clinic. But we put people on these steady state cardio plans fasted in the morning as long as they can tolerate it because that way it jump starts body fat loss if mm -hmm. we have people that don't do any muscle strength training because they don't like it we educate them to say <laughs> i don't like it either 
I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, <laughs> Mr. Big Muscles over here, but I have to do strength training once or twice a week minimum because if you yeah. don't have muscles, you can't boost metabolism. So we put yeah. people on these very specific plans, high intensity interval training. I really believe that high intensity interval training is almost necessary for people with at least one copy of the ApoE4 variant. And this is what yeah. um, has been studied now in, in a couple of studies. And, and yes, we need more We need more research and the studies out of Norway were, were good, but we, we need to personalize an exercise plan. We need to mm. personalize a nutrition plan. We need to personalize mm. a vitamin and supplement plan. In some people, we do use drugs. It's you know, drugs are, are actually not commonly used at all in our in our research. Um, although we do mm. use them on occasion, um, we'll use um, a variety of, of drugs, usually at much lower doses than um, than maybe the, the the regular community uses. Um, but you know, when it comes to um, you know management, um, equal opportunity. If there's data and it's relatively safe. Um, you know, I'll, I'll entertain it. So we recommend, um, you know, cognitive activities that will have a spillover effect, learning something new, learning how to play a musical instrument, learning a new language. These are things that may have a protective effect, build backup pathways. Believe it or not, even learning how to play a musical instrument in midlife has protective effects on cognitive outcomes in late life. And that's there's hope that's, for me yet. There's hope. There's hope for you yet. I, I got my bass guitar over there. I got blisters I'm on my fingers. I'm trying to learn to play the guitar. I'm oh. trying, but I just I'm so. But my big problem is I don't know how to tune it, and I don't. I, I am so musically inept that I, I, I probably there are good apps and things to do it. <laughs> there's there's a website. It's called. You got a pen. It's called YouTube. YouTube, you, oh, yeah, YouTube, may, you may have YouTube, heard of it. You. I heard of it. <laughs> Almost as many people watch YouTube as listen to your podcast. So you can learn how to play guitar on YouTube. I, I think you can do it. Um, okay, I'm going to try. Sh- for sure. So, that's, my, that's my December. <laughs> excellent. End of January and February and March. So the take-home point is engage your brain. Treat yeah. your brain with respect. Love your brain. Make a plan for your brain. What does that mean? Make a plan mm. for sleep. If you exercise and exercise and exercise, some people say colloquially that that loosens the amyloid, the bad protein that gets built up in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's. Mm. But if you're burning the candle at both ends and you're not sleeping during sleep, especially deep sleep, that's when a person mm-hmm. has the trash come. The, the trash man comes, they they pick up the garbage and they take it out and they take it to the, the trash heap. That is the restorative part of sleep. And if someone isn't sleeping, you know, at least seven, seven and a half, eight hours of sleep is usually the goal. As we get older, it's you know, harder to sleep that much. Um, But making a plan for sleep, prioritizing sleep. Um, You know, we have people that track their sleep, that track their exercise. I'm wearing a a wrist device here. I have nothing to disclose, but we've done, you know, several research using this this device. I track people on my phone. I have my phone right here and I can Mm -hmm. check how much exercise they've been doing, how their sleep, how much deep sleep. I can see their blood sugar control. I can see all these different things on my phone because my patients mm. um, share their data with me. And when mm. I talk about data sharing, it's not just about tracking sleep. It's not just about doing exercise. It's about tracking it, determining the response, talking to your physician about it. Granted, it's hard to find physicians that will take the time to talk to you about this kind of stuff. Tracking your blood sugar. There's you know, at home devices called continuous glucose monitors. In our program, we take a very, very deep dive and we learn about all of these different metrics and we refine or fine tune the plan that we give them based on their real time measurements. Um, so, mm. you know, I can keep going. There's stress modification, yeah. um, you know, uh, transcendental meditation. Bob Roth's taught me a ton about this. Um, what about mindfulness based stress reduction? You can take a course online. Mindfulness based restru- stress reduction has amazing outcomes when it comes to brain health. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, there's no one magic pill or one magic cure, but there are a variety of, huh, I was going to say pharmacological and non pharmacological, but you're, you're reevaluating how I say this now. There are a variety of interventions that are evidence based and safe that I think all of us need to learn about. Um, you know, whether we talk about fasting and 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 i like the term time restricted eating better meaning not eating for 12 14 16 hours overnight so at least four or five days a week um i use the term fasting for a more prolonged fast uh you know 24 hours or more and that's 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 a different discussion um there's the ketogenic diet there's the mediterranean style diet there's the mind diet there's components of each diet green leafy vegetables wild salmon Grass-fed beef better than non-grass-fed beef because of the omega-3s. There's so many devil is in the details. Half a cup of blueberries and strawberries two to three times a week. You know, 
leads to better brain health outcomes and cognitive outcomes in the nurse's health study, you know, many years later on. There's dark cocoa powder. There's so many things that I can drop in as, as key yeah. things. But the take home point is all of these things need to be individualized. So, so let me, let me ask you this, because I mean, you know, for, first I want to just kind of feedback because what you, when I'm listening to you thinking you're a neurologist, but you're <laughs> also an immunologist, a cardiologist, yeah. an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist, a nutritionist, yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. You're breaking down the paradigm of medicine, yeah. which is we should stay in our lane, focus mm -hmm. on our organ and leave the rest to everybody else. Yeah. And your insight here is that the body is a system, that everything's connected to everything, yeah. that you can't just pick out one thing and work on that, like amyloid or tau or whatever, and get to the problem. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it's sort of like trying to, you know, bail the boat while there's holes in it. You yeah. got to fix the holes. Yeah. And, and essentially the holes that you're talking about are all these ways in which our brain gets injured by our lifestyle and by our environment. And you didn't mention toxins, but that also plays a large role. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden we have to sort of rethink our whole approach, which has really been a reductionist approach, single disease, single drug with a single outcome. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was an article in JAM a number of years ago called Shifting Thinking in Dementia. You probably saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they said in that article that we combine categorical misclassification mm -hmm. with etiologic imprecision. And in English, for those listening, mm -hmm. that means <laughs> we categorize dementia according to symptoms, not the causes. Mm -hmm. And we, we are not very focused on the etiology or the causes. We're focused on the symptoms. And we say, well, you can't remember this and you fit this profile on your neurocognitive testing. You have Alzheimer's or you have this kind of dementia or Lewy body or blah, blah, blah. And the reality is that you could have 10 people with Alzheimer's who need 10 different treatments. And that's exactly what you're talking about. That's heresy, Richard. Mm -hmm. That's heresy in medicine, honestly, because yeah. we, we really have, have a very, very restricted reductionist view of disease that doesn't let us actually even study these things. And I've, I've literally had arguments with top uh, leading researchers, like heads of research at major institutions saying, mm -hmm. these are all the factors that affect the brain. We want to study them together. So, oh no, you have to study one thing at a time and then see how that works. And then one thing, so study exercise and then study nutrition and then study vitamin D, then study fish oil. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not how things actually work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, you have to use all the whole picture. Uh, the, the other thing I sort of wanted to sort of touch on was that you, you, you're sort of introducing a concept of the personalization, which again is, is very different in medicine. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not one size fits all. And, and, and you're talking about very sophisticated personalization based on a whole set of biomarkers and tests and things that are easily accessible, but that, that aren't normally looked at and that aren't normally tested. You know, yeah. you get your typical panel, you get your thyroid, your B12, you get your spinal fluid done, you get your MRI and you go, okay, you got Alzheimer's. <laughs> like it's sort of a little bit more complicated than that, but it's, it's really mm -hmm. a, a fairly narrow window of biomarkers and metrics. And there's bazillions of them. Mm -hmm. And and I think we're just sort of touching touching the the sort of tip of the iceberg on this. And I and I've seen in my patients when you start to apply these concepts of personalized care mm -hmm. around food, around exercise, around sleep, around stress, around supplements, around everything that you you really begin to see dramatic changes in brain function. Yeah, I um you know I, I, I often joke that I'm like a one third neurologist, but a preventative neurologist at that. I'm a one third um, make believe. I will, full disclosure, I'm not a preventative cardiologist, but I'm a make believe preventative cardiologist. I'm a one third primary care doctor and make believe preventative endocrinologist. I don't even know any preventative endocrinologists. I, if you find one, introduce <laughs> them to me. Um, I, I was trained in an environment. I went to a six-year medical program where I was in med school from day one, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Oh, I knew I wanted sorry. to be a doctor when I was five, <laughs> 17 years old, wearing my white coat. And I did so much internal medicine during med school. I had like an extra year of medicine because that's the way our training was. Yeah. And I don't know if yeah. it was that or I'm not sure exactly what it was, but Alzheimer's disease is a medical disease. Yeah. Full stop. That's it. There's this yeah. thing called the skull and it's a hard yeah. thing that yeah. protects you when you fall, but it's just like it, it, 
it's like when you have medical conditions, you can affect your kidneys. When you have medical conditions, it can affect your eyes. It can affect your heart. The same mm. thing, it can affect your brain. And I couldn't agree with you more. People can take different roads to Alzheimer's. And mm. you have to figure out what road they're on and get the get them the heck off that road. Women, for example, are unfortunately many times in the fast lane to Alzheimer's. Women, yeah. two out of every three brains affected by Alzheimer's are women's brains. And five, 10 years ago, I, I would say I didn't know why. And now I think I can answer that question. And it's related to the perimenopause transition. It's related to specific life factors. It's related to women being maybe a little bit more at risk if they have the ApoE4 variant. So the take home point here is if you understand a person's individual risk factors, whether it's biological sex, whether it's medical conditions, whether it's what's floating around in their blood, whether it's what is their cognitive function at baseline. You have to figure these things out and then you have to target that plan and personalize that plan. And I mean, Alzheimer's disease and, and, and brain health needs to be treated in a medical way because if it's yeah. not, if you're just targeting amyloid, um, you're missing the boat. You know, amyloid's a marker. And, and I think hopefully one day we're going to have, just like we treat diabetes with lifestyle interventions and, and, and exercise and as well as certain targeted drugs that honestly, some of them actually do, do tend to work pretty well. I'm not the biggest fan of insulin. Like that doesn't, mm -hmm, that's, that's mm -hmm. maybe band-aiding to me. That's probably yeah. too late. I mean, I'm not yeah. the best, yeah. whatever, but, but some of these new, uh, you know, uh, new things that are, are pretty interesting. I won't get into specifics, but I hope that one day we treat Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline, like any other chronic disease of aging, where we hit things with a multimodal evidence-based and safe approach um, that yeah. requires a medical intervention. So essentially what you're saying, to, to paraphrase, is that Alzheimer's is not a brain disease. Correct. It's a systemic disease that affects the brain. Yeah, I really believe that. And and that um, I have to be careful yeah. saying that. Is this being recorded? <laughs> oh, yes. no. And it's going to be broadcast to billions of people around the world. Oh, great. Great. My, my field. Uh, I was just trying to, I was just gaining some, from some, some fans in, in my field. And now it's all last a decade of work. No, no, no. What are you going to do? We, we, you, you are, you are at the forefront of a paradigm shift that's happening throughout medicine, which is the breakdown of the old concepts of disease from mm -hmm. simply this reductionist organ based, symptom based model to systems thinking and network medicine. And that's really all you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you've touched upon some of the most easily accessible and modifiable factors, which is what we eat, how we exercise, how we handle and manage stress, how we sleep. Those are, those four pillars are, are huge. And then mm -hmm. there's the fine tuning with, you know, managing metabolic risk factors or getting their nutrient levels up to a certain level. Yeah. But there's a whole treasure trove of stuff that, that we, I think still haven't even dug into. It's like, it's like I, I visited Ephesus in Turkey, mm -hmm. and it's the largest Roman city during the Roman Empire. It's, it was it was incredible. And it was all buried under dirt and mm -hmm. you know rubble, and they excavated it. But there's they're still figure, they're still you know excavating it a hundred years right. later, and it's it's just fascinating to see that there's so much we don't know. And I would say, in my experience as a functional medicine doctor, I've seen things that have impact on the brain that that aren't really included, like heavy metals. Do we do we even have uh, a way of, of testing that is in conventional medicine for heavy metals? Not really. We just do a blood test and then we don't worry about it if it's okay. But there may be total body burden of toxins we don't look at. The microbiome is another huge factor that affects the brain and Alzheimer's. Uh, and, and mitochondrial function is something we, we you talk about, but it's, it's often ignored. And we we have uh, in, latent infections that, that may be affecting the brain that cause mm -hmm. inflammation, whether it's, oh, yeah. uh, you know, herpes 2 may be linked, but there may be other things. I mean, I mean Chris mm -hmm. Christofferson had Lyme disease and got diagnosed with dementia. Uh, there may be environmental factors like mold that have impact on inflammation. So we know that the brain with patients with dementia is inflamed. And then the causes of that inflammation can be multiple. And so part of the, the diagnostic dive that you're doing and I would just sort of encourage you to think about this is that, that you're getting to, you know, all the stuff that we do know that's so clearly evidence-based, but then there's a whole treasure trove of things to look at that we're kind of ignoring. And I, I'm just going to take like two seconds. I know it's, it's your pod, my podcast, but you're talking, but I'm just <laughs> going to just talk about this one patient. Cause it just, it was the first patient I had where I'm like, came in the guy with Alzheimer's, I'm like, can you do anything? I'm like, I have no clue. I don't know, but I'm just going to apply the model of systems of biology and functional medicine. Let's see what we do. We found he was severely insulin resistant. He had, which is, you know, we talk about Alzheimer's as type three diabetes which is in the brain. 
he had very high homocysteine levels and methylation problems. So his, his genetics were off around metabolizing B vitamins in the right way, which we know is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. He had um, the ApoE4 double four gene. Mm -hmm. So he's the 1%. Mm -hmm. He was seven years old, cognitively impaired, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, basically at home, not able to do anything, depressed, not functioning. It was the former CEO of his company. Mm -hmm. he, also, he also had other nutritional deficiencies like vitamin D, and he had been living in Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, uh, it's the capital of steel. Mm -hmm. And for a century, they've been burning coal for the steel plants. And they use coal there for the streets on the winter for ice. They put it on the fields for fertilizer and what they do. It's, it's everywhere. And all my patients in Pittsburgh have high mercury levels. Mm -hmm. And he had very, very, very high mercury levels. When we did a challenge test, he also had a mouthful of fillings. And we know that if you look at, you know, amalgam scores in surface area and you look at animal studies, the more amalgams you put in their mouth, the more mercury ends up in their brain. And, and so I said, well, I don't know. I don't know if anything I'm going to do is going to work, but let's fix your insulin resistance. Let's fix your, also, he had terrible gut issues. He had irritable bowel for 30 years and was on stelazine for his stomach, which is a psychotic, antipsychotic drug to kind of calm his stomach down. Hmm. And I fixed his stomach. I clean up his diet, fix the insulin resistance. I fixed the B vitamin thing. I got rid of the metals and the guy came back to life. And it, and it was really, really remarkable. And he was able to go back to work and function again and be part of his family and be part of his society in a way that I was just shocked. And so I, I think that, you know, there's a level of stuff that we're looking at and then there's a whole bunch of stuff we're not looking at. So I'd, I'd love you to comment on that and what your thoughts are about all that other stuff that's going on. Yeah. So, um, and thanks for sharing the story because, you know, every story is instructive because this is, this and is, I'll send you the article I, that I described I, as a, as a uh, editorial I wrote for a medical journal. I'll, I'll just, mm -hmm. cause you, you'll go, wow, you know, yeah. this is interesting. So, you know, um, you know, the thing that resonates me with the story is, you know, when you have people with apoe 4 fours, um, those are just different eggs and, and, um, you know, E4 fours may be, you know, for example, E4 fours, um, may be preferentially responsive to vitamin D, for example. So, you know, some studies show that vitamin D, eh, maybe it's not really that preventative. Oh, some studies show, oh, maybe it, it is more preventative. Well, people with two copies of the E4 variant, which is again, not, not super common. Those people really need to have their vitamin Ds up. And that's, and you know, that's, that's just an example there, but you know, people with the APOE4 variant, you know, uh, pesticides, DDT and DDE, the interaction yeah. between E4 and pesticides increases Alzheimer's risk several fold. If people don't have the APOE4 variant, maybe they're not as exposed or maybe they're not as uh, increased risk to Alzheimer's. So when you look at a whole population, you don't tease out for E4 positive versus negative. Mm. The studies mm. may not show any correlation, but mm. in practice, we see the correlation. And mm. in other mm. studies, you do see the correlation. So mm. I think you know, something I learned, I was at a, a conference in, in Canada. You have a lot of fans in Canada, by the way. Just, just FYI, your, your name came up there. Um, true. It's, actually, every, it's, it's everywhere. I get everywhere. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in Istanbul at the airport and some guy from the security comes running up to me. I thought I like was going to get arrested for smuggling something. <laughs> like I smuggling my Turkish delights back to America. <laughs> and he's like, Dr. Ayman, can I take a picture with you? And I'm like, oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> International. Um, so I was at this. I was at this thing in Canada, and amazing people, just smart people, and and you know we were given presentations, and of course I'm like you know the science guy, and I'm like a I'm a clinician, I'm like a I'm like a regular doctor. I don't want to yeah. say Joe Schmo like you and me, but like, you know, but, but I was thrown into this clinical research thing. And, and again, I had research resources, infrastructure, did work hard to learn, hired the right people. So yes, I've done research. And when you do research, you need to have objective measures to follow that you mm -hmm. can track. I was at this mm -hmm. gr group in Canada, this guy named uh, Gary um, and Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth's uh, a naturopathic doctor and Gary um, is just really, really, really smart. And they were working together um, to present on a topic. And it's kind of like a, a bulb, light bulb came off my head. And I said, you know, I'm so focused in the objective because I need to be, because I'm a researcher. If I'm going to say something and think it, I need to then prove it. Because if I'm in an academic environment, you know, I was at Wild Cornell Medicine for, for a New York Presbyterian for you know, you know, almost eight, eight, nine years. And now I'm at Florida Atlantic University doing a, a really, a, a really exciting program in brain health and, and, and Alzheimer's prevention, Parkinson's prevention, dementia with Lewy body prevention, yes, yes, get to do yes. some really cool things. It, 
maybe I'm missing the boat a little bit because if I'm just focusing on the objective that I need to track and prove, there's a lot of stuff under the surface that I can't really uh, track and prove because I don't have a biomarker to do that. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is as, as I've, um, uh, I know what I know and I don't know, know and I don't know. I'm consciously mm. incompetent about things. Mm. And, and, <laughs> and the story that you, that you say is, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm I am, uh, there are people that are unconsciously incompetent and those people drive me a little bit uh, batty, but yeah, I am, I, I'm, with, I'm with you. I'm on your team. I'm on the, excellent. I know what I don't know. Yeah. I know what I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm willing to have my eyes opened and um, you know, the stories that you say, it's like, as a physician, you, you, you have to treat someone in a certain way to try to make them better, but we don't always have all the objective, you know, evidence and, mm -hmm. and the types of work that we do on patients, it's really hard to study. Like I have empathy for people, you know, in our boat who are trying to study yeah. the rigorous, you know, rigorously study because what's moving the needle to me, I don't care what's moving the needle. People were criticizing, you know, one of my research papers. Oh, you recommended 21 things. What if 18 of them are helping and three of them are harming. You'll never know. And I said, exactly. okay, but, but look at the results. 18 months later, people with amyloid in their brain with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease that followed this plan, 18 months later, as long as they followed 60% or more of what I recommended, had better cognitive outcomes 18 months later. We were able to improve symptoms. There's no drug that can improve symptoms at eight, we, slowing decline is one thing, improving symptoms. So, so I'm, 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 I'm Zen with not being able to precisely understand which of my 21 things are working. Um, but, but I think, you know, as clinicians, I think we just have to do the best we can. And um, we want to, you know, promise not to over promise. I think that's important too. You, you, you said at the beginning when you were seeing that, that patient, I'm not a hundred percent sure, you know, yada, yada, but I'm going to try all the usual things and, and, you know, something worked. So I think yeah. as long as we have honest conversations with our patients and and um, and do the best, you know, people like us that have academic appointments and are, are in that you know realm, I think we it's it's you know it's it's my duty in some ways at this time in my life in my career to try to prove as much as I can. But I think I think the field and I think people need to realize that some things are, are really hard to study and prove. Yeah, and they are. But you know what's happening now is is with the acceleration of our understanding of how to map biology and things we couldn't even measure before, mm -hmm. we're able to start to you know, look at different diagnostics than we ever did before and find things we never found before. Yeah. And, and within the diaspora of medicine, which is where I've been most of my life, <laughs> there, there has a, there's a lot of people doing really interesting diagnostics that are ignored, like heavy metal testing. For me, that's like a, that's like a blood pressure. When someone comes in and they have any kind of uh, you know, toxic or immune or cognitive or any chronic symptoms, I look at it because it's often an annoying fact. It was actually how I figured this all out was through my own mercury poisoning from living in China. And I had severe cognitive impairment and also immune dysregulation and gut issues. And I, I think the, the, you know, the gut stuff is, is such a, a big deal. And that's something we can start to understand with the microbiome and its effect. And there's data coming out. Then the question is, as clinicians, we never learn, well, how do we repair a microbiome that's off, right? How do we do that? Like that's okay. Well, we may know, okay, if you're low in vitamin D, take vitamin D. But like if we test the microbiome and there's all this inflammation and dysbiosis and like the average doc has no clue where to start. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem is we just don't have one, uh, some of the diagnostics we need, or, or if we do, the average practitioner has no clue what to do with it. And I think we're, we're all going to, all that's going to change. I think, I think what you're talking about is, is managing something that until now I don't think has been able to be managed by the average doctor, which is, God, there's a hundred things we could find that could affect the brain. That, I think there's probably a thousand or maybe there's 10,000, but mm -hmm. the average person and the average doctor cannot process all that and mm -hmm. make the connections. But with the advent of quantified self metrics, which you talked about with the advent of advanced diagnostic metrics and metabolomics and the, you know, the understanding even the microbiome metabolomics, for example, nobody talks about that, but it's, it's the metabolome of the microbiome in your blood. There's probably 20 to 50% of the metabolites in your blood come from the bugs in your gut. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and how does all that work? Well, that's going to require big data and machine learning and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and start to see the data and the patterns and connections. So I think that's where this is all headed. And, and, you, you know, it, it, you, you know, we have to stop this paradigm of, being reductionist and saying, just take this one drug for Alzheimer's. And I get so frustrated when I hear these studies come out and they had big news articles and, oh, this helps or that helps. I'm like, what about all the rest of the stuff that Richard's mm -hmm. talking about? <laughs> like, you know? 
it's got to be frustrating for you too because you you see it you see your patients get better and you go hey guys like yeah. um why don't you try this and what do your friends say who are also neurologists or memory specialists do they think you're yeah. a quack or you know, are they like well, listening are they <laughs> you know i'm i'm a pretty resilient guy i gave my first talk in 2007 about um you know how mci mild cognitive impairment due to alzheimer's and you know in this this pre symptomatic I, I i i didn't like that term i just felt it should be you know prodromal at risk you know that I, I felt like we should be treating people before they had dementia and when i kind of set that stage and, and I, I wrote about this in, in one of my books um names not naming names but and i didn't name the name there too but one of the giants in the field was sitting there and like just i don't want to say rolled their eyes but just just but there's no evidence there's just there's no evidence for, there's nothing you can do there's no evidence for die there's no evidence for this there's no evidence for that but there was no impetus to even aim to study it um you know i started seeing alzheimer's prevention patients in 20 2009 dr um arthur agatson was one of my, my mentors really oh yeah arthur you yeah know, uh, ama amazing guy uh, you know he was my yeah. my attending at mount sinai medical center when i was oh, an intern yeah before, i liked him yeah before the south beach diet before you know he's, he's known <laughs> as the south beach diet guy but to me he's the he's the agatson calcium score guy like to, yes, him, to right. me he's he's the visionary that that was one of the first preventative cardiologists um and and preventing disease and starting before there are symptoms it was so um the tomatoes that were thrown at me were, um, you know, the big vi uh, vine ripe tomatoes. Like they were big. <laughs> now, um, I don't know if my reflexes are better. Um, I have cat like reflexes now. I have a cat behind me, but um, I can dodge the tomatoes better. My armor is thicker. <laughs> The tomatoes are not being thrown as quickly, <laughs> um, but it's it's also because you know you know we've now published we've published results yeah. and and you know I, I would talk to a journal editor um, five six years ago and I said well this this and this and this and, and this is what I see and you know it's 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 clear and he said well it may be clear to you but you need to prove it and then you need your peers to review the article and accept uh, that your that your thoughts and your observations are substantiated by evidence. And I feel right. like in the last five years, um, just eight years, actually, we, we've, we've been able to do about as good of a job as possible, uh, with, with the limited resources that we have. Now, if, if, if that, if, if, if 1% of the billions of dollars or, or heck, 10% of the billions of dollars would have come in the prevention um, uh, bucket. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you if, if someone drops a very large sum of money um, in our research program to prove this, we can do it, but it's hard. Prevention yeah. studies are expensive because they take longer. Prevention studies, you need to follow people for years rather than, you know, six months or nine months or a year. Yeah. So, so, so I think, you know, the reason that um, my colleagues are, coming around is because of the publications and building the, you know, the body of evidence. I think the other reason that my colleagues are coming around is several of them have, have come visit. I've invited, I've had over yeah. 45 other uh, physicians and other healthcare providers come visit me and sit next yeah. to me. And, and if someone isn't willing to sit next to me and my, if someone is willing to criticize the work we do, but not willing mm -hmm. to come sit next to me, and spend spend a couple hours and just watch just look it's it's oh this is only one patient it's, it doesn't mean anything right. when you see this once yeah, and yeah, you yeah. see it again and you see it at nine o'clock ten o'clock eleven and then yeah. one o'clock yeah. two o'clock and three thirty yeah. you you just you know like okay fine prove it i get that but um th there are still skeptics out there there are still skeptics yeah. and i still get criticism every day and um i don't want to say okay. i'm jaded but um you know <laughs> haters gonna hate I'm going to keep yeah. doing my thing. And, uh, well, you know, and, well, you know, you know, what Max Planck said, right? He said, uh, no, he said, he's, he said, he said, he said, he he said that, that was <laughs> no, 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 no. That was Max Planck. <laughs> yeah. oh. No, he said, he said, uh, science, but you could say medicine doesn't evolve by convincing your opponents and helping them see the light right. but because they eventually die and a new generation grows up. That's familiar with it. In other words, medicine progresses one funeral at a time. <laughs> that's kind of mean, but that's what he said. <laughs> and and I think, you know, the other point is that the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence, yeah. right? If we haven't spent billions of dollars studying nutrition and Alzheimer's, how the heck do we know anything? We spent billions of dollars studying drugs that don't work, but not the right things. And the other thing, Richard, I'm going to push back pretty hard on, on this for you because you keep talking about preventive neurology and preventing Alzheimer's. And yes, yes, we should do all that. But your study, your own study showed that you can not only prevent it, but reverse the symptoms. Now, 
how far can we go to reverse it? How much can we reverse it? How far can these treatments work? What if we added 10 other things that maybe we haven't even thought of that might be as or more impactful than the, than the 25 things you're already doing? You know, I, I would push back and start to encourage you to think about treatment studies, not reversal studies, because those you'll see outcomes much quicker. And if you can take a group of 10, 20, 50 people and be really aggressive, and it's not easy because changing, and I, and I have these patients, I'm treating many of them right now, it's the roughest thing because if you have an engaged patient, you know, someone's had a heart attack and you tell them to change their diet and, and eat their vitamins and exercise, they'll go, oh, I get it. But you've got someone with dementia or who's cognitively impaired, they can't remember stuff. You need a full-time like bodyguard literally with them, mm. telling them what to do and helping them do it. But if you did those kinds of studies, I, I think you would see dramatic changes. If you love that last video, you should check out the next one for sure on getting to the root cause of all disease. Pathogenic microbes, bacteria, yeast, viruses, may be doing the seeding of the plaques, where the plaques are actually forming to protect the